everyone knows what a monarch looks like, and maybe you even know how they start out. A tiny little egg, smaller than the head of a pin, gets laid on a milkweed. That first instar hatches out, and in two or three days, it will switch into a second instar, continuing to grow ever larger and larger. Every two, three, four, five days, depending on temperature, it will actually change into whatever version of the larva it's supposed to be. After about two weeks, you can actually see how they have literally exploded in size. There's all the instars here on this picture. Then they hang upside down, literally digest their own skin, turn it into a chrysalis, and when they come out as a butterfly, they fly away and off into the sunset they go, unless they happen to be members of the super generation. The last generation of the four or five generations that live throughout the summer will actually not breed. Instead, they'll make their way thousands of miles to the Oyamel forest in the mountains of central Mexico. There, they spend their winters in pine trees, coming down occasionally to drink, and they will not mate, not eat, but when it starts to get warmer, they will head back up to North America. They make it about as far as Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, from Mexico. They'll lay eggs, and the super generation that's nine months old will die. The rest of the generations during the summer only last about two and a half to three weeks. To learn more about this phenomenon, I went to talk with my good friend Dave O'Donnell. Normally Dave comes into our classes and tells us about the monarchs that he raises and, and the ones that he helps rehabilitate. But this year, uh, because of the, the coronavirus, we decided to go to his farm and do some taping there. So this is a little bit longer than your normal seminar, but I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dave O'Donnell. So, so here we are. So you're probably wondering what's in the hummingbird feeders, aren't you? Go ahead and ask me. Hey Dave. Yeah. What's in the hummingbird feeders? I can't tell you. Oh, okay. Because good. it's a secret recipe. Oh, wow, very good. But what we do is we feed our, our friends here with um, nectar that I make. It's made out of amino acids, okay. soy sauce, soy sauce, and fructose from fruit. Okay. Basically confection sugar. It's a lot sweeter than your normal sugar. Right. And it doesn't recrystallize in their little bodies. So on a hot day like what we have now, right. it's nice and cool and not too bad in here, but uh, sugar can recrystallize in those little abdomens and kill them. All right for hummingbirds and stuff like that, but butterflies and other small insects should not have real right. sugar. So that's what we do. And then the uh, the soy sauce is for the males. It's for their reproductive organs. And uh, when you see butterflies like puddling around a shore or a brook, right. they're getting minerals from the from the soil. It's like their little watering hole. Okay. And that helps their uh, reproductive organs. So like this one over here, you sit here. I will bring that couple over. I know they'd like to have us talk about them. Okay. So these two are mating right now. So this one, uh, they're connected. Right now the male is passing the sperm sacs to the female. I'm not going to hold them too long. I'm going to put them up here. But they will stay together for almost 24 hours okay. until they pass the sac. And then when, when she lays her eggs, they will be fertilized at the time that they lay them. Right. So we raise about 1,500 or so a year, and these all get released. There's another couple over there. And right behind you, I will look. Uh, these are all, uh, probably got eggs on these, so they're starting to lay eggs now. Let's see what we got here. So see the little white eggs all over the bottom of the leaves? Oh, there you go. These are all monarch eggs. Uh, there's going to be hundreds in here very shortly because they just started mating. Okay. 
take a few days to start mating. And these uh, plants are going to be covered with too many eggs. So what I do is I give them out at the farmer's market. I give them to people. Uh, I have more people getting involved in raising monarchs. And then I educate them on how to raise monarchs properly, disease-free. Right. And with a 98% mortality rate, it gets monarchs out in different communities and people Absolutely. actually love doing it. It gets people outdoors. Oh, they're super nature. charismatic. You know, I'm sitting here next to yeah. seven of them, you know. And, it's and they're just going about their business. They're, everybody's real peaceful here. And, um, yeah, they do love the swamp milkweed, the flower, as do all butterflies. But uh, the leaves are the most important part of all the milkweed plants because as soon as that starts growing, these guys will be looking for a place to lay an egg. So it's a wonderful plant, and it's what I've started doing for 25 years. I started with the swamp milkweed plant. You're probably wondering how I got involved. How did you get involved with a swamp <laughs> milkweed plant? Well, when I was riding along our local bike path here over 20-some years ago, found this plant growing along the side of the mill, uh, bike path. And it looked just like this. It had butterflies on it, like we're looking at it, and a couple of big caterpillars. And I said, hey, what is that? That's not a milkweed plant, because I'm used to the common the milkweed. The common milkweed, right. And I'm looking at it and thought it was like some type of escapee from a nursery. Sure. Went home, looked it up, and aha, it's a native swamp milkweed, a slepreous Incarnata. So I went back because I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get the caterpillar and raise it and watch the whole metamorphosis. Don't I go back and what happened? You watched the whole metamorphosis. No, nope, the died. plant was mowed to the ground. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I went back and I'm, I'm on my bike. I go, holy, holy crap, where'd the plant go? Bunch of pile of sticks, yeah. both sides mowed right to the ground. And I said, son of a gun. Came back the next day with my little shovel on my bike, dug up the whole root system, okay. put it on my handlebars, or keep in mind that I'm 50 years old, right. <laughs> and uh, brought that back, planted it, and started doing this. Presentations, explaining to people about native plants, the importance of them, and then I started selling milkweed plants at the farmer's market, plants. And they would laugh at me like, are you kidding me? Why are you selling a milkweed? And I thought to myself, hmm, they're making fun of me. So I started bringing the caterpillar, the egg, the monarch with me. And then there was a line in front of my table saying, what is all this? I mean, and I explained to them, this is the only plant of monarch in the And then here we are today. So, yep. so what I do is I wrap these in uh, burlap. And this is how I like sell them. See how the roots come right through there? Right, absolutely. And uh, people like that. It's a lot more work. You know, I charge a little bit more because of the time and stuff like that. But uh, you can put this right in the ground, just cover it up to there, and uh, this sure. will all deteriorate. You can't put them in too early. Like I've noticed, they'll grow into each other if they're next to each other. Okay. But uh, I love burlap. It's a great... Are you just using burlap from Hobby Lobby or? No, I, I or order whatever? burlap, okay. like a big roll of it. Okay. Yeah, if you went to Hobby Lobby, it's not. It's a different one. This is a nice tight weed. Okay. And, uh, so I use that. You know, it's it's a start. Right. It's hard to get away from plastics, well, but because, if you make, you know, if, these things. Oh, they're everywhere. You know, they're 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 everywhere, and they're. What do you do with? Them? Right? They're everywhere. You throw them, people throw people them. People throw them out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, I don't even think, most of them you can't even recycle. No. So, no, that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah, so that's how we like to at least make an attempt. Sure. You know, it's my, my idea is that the, the more difficult something is to make a change, I think the better uh, is for the environment. You know, if it's too easy, everybody does it. Well, I started off with two or three caterpillars, then it was ten. And then it was 30, then it was like a little phone booth, and now we do like 1,500 and a lot of lectures and presentations. But they're a great uniter between people and the environment, like we said before, and uh, because of one plant that we call a weed. There were no weeds until humans came here and 
said, hey, you know what? This is a this is a weed. This is a flower. This is a weed. Right. Yeah. So instead of doing it all at once, I'd like to see what's growing. Like this is probably four or five years worth of just taking out non-native plants and doing selective weeding, I call it. But all that back in there, those are all New England asters. That'll be all beautiful purple in the fall. Uh, we've got golden Alexandra that's already went to seed. These are all giant New York ironweed that will be beautiful purple flowers in about another two weeks. And you can almost see the flowers starting on this one. All perennials come up every year and this gets loaded. We got what you and I are doing with the native plant uh, collaboration and the pollinator. We are educating people, especially you with all your students. You're doing a great job of that. Um, getting people involved with native plants and realizing that everything is not uh, a weed. There are some invasive weeds that, uh, like Absolutely. we talked about, doing uh, selective weeding. If you right. had a piece of property like this, you go out once a month and say, hey, there's a foreign rose or one of those right. uh, bad plants. Let's get rid of it before it takes over the property. And uh, that's what we do. And most of the time, we're the ones that brought in those plants in the first place. Exactly. So when you people know, Purple get... loose strife was brought in for as an ornamental because it was Walmart. so great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think they still sell it. But um, exactly, and that's why we do what we do. We get some slack once in a while. People say, oh, you shouldn't be raising monarchs. I'm not going to mention any names, but people will say, uh, oh, just let them be in the wild. But we're the ones that caused all the damage. Right. We're the ones that are spreading the pesticides, causing habitat loss. I feel like there's a, there's a moral issue there, right? It's, it's, it, it's that, you know, things have gone extinct since the beginning of time. Right. You know, 98.5-ish percent of every species that has ever lived is already extinct. That's, that's sad. Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, it's the way of things. Yes. Right? We don't have any giant trilobites anymore. No. We don't have any more Tyrannosaurus rexes. It's yeah. just that we have exasperated it. The like problem that. is, is because of what we've done, we've sped up that process exactly. to a thousand times greater than normal background extinction. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, things have gone extinct, and, you know, milkweed and, and monarch relationships have changed a million times. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't our fault. That's right. It was just a natural progression. Right. But with the climate change, which I believe is our fault. Of course. Things are changing, and that's what's affecting the monarchs. There's a wild monarch right. trying to get in right now on the outside, <laughs> trying to get to one of these females. Smelling those were, pheromones. Yes, but um, uh, what was I saying? Well, no, you, you, the, the the morality issue. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, helping the monarchs by raising some is great for people to get involved with nature. Right. But we're not talking to people raising them for weddings. And uh, there's one that found a girlfriend on the ground. Well, well. He took her right out of the air. But. Um, by doing that, they're helping them uh, overcome the, the, you know, what's happening. That's right. Because there's, uh, there's so much against them now. You know, they lay 400 eggs a piece. If everyone has, there'd be too many monarchs. But with the uh, human uh, population and habitat loss, right. Drops, they just uh, can't what, recover. Below and 0.7 and 1.2. Yep, and the, and the warmer climate is bringing in all kinds of invasive insects. Uh, that are killing the and diseases and diseases. I've got pictures of stink bugs eating caterpillars all over the place. Really? I've got them with uh, caterpillars just suck the guts right out of it. I can send you those pictures. I got them here. It's nothing worse than seeing a big, beautiful monarch, right. and then it's got the big stink bug attached to it, assassin bugs. And most of those are non-native that uh, we're responsible for bringing over. But like you said, climate change is happening. And with the heat, monarchs don't do well in high humidity. So they're starting to migrate farther up into Canada with the milkweed and everything else. But someday. that puts them further away from their overwinter. Right. So someday, they may not go to Mexico. They may say, you know, why are we going to Mexico? 
But theoretically, I mean, the Oyamel Forest is is perfect because of its location, its humidity, its temperature, exactly. right? But it's disappearing as well with climate change. Absolutely. So with climate change, you know, what do you say to instead of going all the way to Mexico, now they only have to go to Arizona to find a similar... Exactly. Right, and that, that could be, but are we willing to risk an entire species to take that chance? That's right. That's right. But, so they're still going to Mexico. And even the wild ones, or the, the, the captive range ones that we talk about, they have now done studies that they readjust. Like if these are raised in captivity now, once they're released, mm -hmm. they readjust within days. And that's a natural. that's a big topic of... That of, is a big topic. You know, and, a lot of the Monarch Watch people, a lot of the, the other, you know, research that's coming out of the different universities saying, nah, maybe reared ones don't do so well. Right, but there's still pollinators here. Right. And they have found a lot of them do migrate to Mexico, and I think a higher percentage than the ones that actually die and don't make it because of all the stuff that's going on. So I'll, I'll just continue doing what we're doing right. until there's definite, you know, science changes every day, don't you agree? Oh, and, and look at masks, no masks, gloves, say, no gloves, right? It, and, it, and so how do we, but that's science. That's science, and it's supposed to change. Right, and I keep coming up, I keep seeing these, uh, you know, interesting editorials of, of people saying, well, the public is finally seeing how science works, that they argue back and forth until we come up with the best answer, and, and even that could change, Oh yeah. right? And they're like, well, scientists can't agree. Well, no, 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 this is just how it's always worked. You just never paid attention to it before. That's right, that's right. So, you know, it's something happened where I saw that what we were doing was really causing harm. Of course I wouldn't do it. Right. And, and this year, probably in December, you're supposed to make a ruling on monarchs to be on the endangered list. Very good. Yeah, it was supposed to come up in December. It was postponed last year. Who knows? Well, I mean, the federal government's really proven themselves as being very efficient lately. So Sure. And, you know, we don't always agree with that either, though. Like, from my point of view, let's say they make it to the list. Right. Now you're going to open up a can of worms. Oh, absolutely. If you, every farmer's going to hate what's happening because they got milkweed. Okay, yep. you can't mow that field down. It's got milkweed. And it takes it out of the hands of the people. We the people. It does. They, we have done a great job of repopulating the monarchs. They have come up in the last few years more than, uh, they were way down in 1999. It's because of people doing what uh, we're doing and you're doing. And, uh, it gives people a sense of being able to contribute. Right. And if you take that away from them, you know. Okay. So, what we have here is a monarch chrysalis, a pupa, with all kinds of names. So these are found out. This is what they would look like out in the wild. I took these off the of plants. I mean, those are just beautiful. Yeah. Uh, it looks like an earring. Uh, it does. It I, what, always, what always gets me is that gold. It, and you people, know, that little, little line. At the farmer's market, people think that I decorate these. They, because if you've never seen them, they're, they're yeah. incredible. They go, oh, you're kidding me. I said, no. Inside oh, here beautiful. is a monarch. And they, they'll say things like, well, they spin that in moon. But actually, a monarch takes its skin off and drops it to the ground, and inside it forms that. Right. It's kind of gooey, right? right. Am I explaining okay? that to you right? You're all right. right there. And, uh, but that'll, that'll emerge in about 10 to 12 days. So to raise money, what we do is we use these little cups, and we have a nice little top, and I use this drywall tape, and then this one hangs from there, and this monarch will emerge inside the cup. Okay. And people can watch it, and they're amazed that they release it in their yard. And uh, it's just a, a great thing for, I have more adults to do this. Oh, kids. absolutely. Uh, they just, they're amazed at the whole absolutely. thing. It's like, where have people been? 
you and I have known this about is a, Yeah, we, we did this when we were kids. Yeah, but, but there's so many people out there. But what I love is that this is, you know, it, I talk about with, with the kids all the time, it is, is that, you know, environmental consciousness isn't made, it, it isn't just come upon. You don't wake up one day, you know, move off the grid, grow all your own food, buy a Prius, and, and join the Sierra Club. It doesn't work that way. No. Right? It's it's one thing at a time. You know? And it's part of being outdoors. Right. Like you were as a kid, and I was. I think more kids need to get the heck out of it. Absolutely. Maybe they're not environmental people. Maybe they're not environmentally aware, ecologically aware. Mm-hmm. You know, they live in a house in the suburbs, and they mow their grass, and they, you know, they drive their suburban and do whatever. But that one thing leads to other things. That one monarch exactly. at the farmer's market leads to, hey, what other kind of butterflies are there? Hey, why don't we plant some of these native plants that exactly. attract them? And before you know it, you know, our, our hippies will be taking over the world. Exactly, and that's what I get comments all the time. I can show you hundreds of emails from people saying, I love what you're doing. Uh, the kids are out looking under leaves for milkweed. That's wonderful. And they're, and they're taking the leaf off. And when's the last time kids looked under, their kids looked under leaves exactly. to begin with? Exactly, yep. Right? And so it's building an awareness that leads to a change in attitudes and and the change in, in, in behaviors. Exactly. And I do preschools, too. And this year I had a lady come up to the market and said, what did you do to my kid? They won't let me cut the lawn. They won't let me take any <laughs> weeds out. And I said, oh, it's working. So this is our, these are our caterpillars here. So this is, uh, wonderful. This is how we started out. These are all. About third? It's about the third in there. Yeah, very good. You know your caterpillars. Well, you? I, yeah. I may have of, taught this once or twice. There's probably a couple of first ones out yeah, there. Yeah, we got a two, we got a, a three, a, almost a four. Yeah, there's a couple of fours in here. So I've got a few of these cages around, but these are great uh, cages for raising monarchs. We actually sell these to people who want to do it. And is that these, what is is that repurposed from this something? Is, no, is that? no, this is professional butterfly rearing cage. Okay, you want to get this thrift off of there? Mm. We're going to put them back in. Okay. But these are washable with bleach. You okay. can clean these. There's a chrysalis up there in the corners. Here. Oh, there you go. Okay. So what they'll do is they'll make their chrysalis up here. Right. Which works out very good. They're easy to uh, detach from here. Now, what's the benefit of having them in a cage if they're already in a flight pen here? Well, this isn't parasite food. Um, okay. There's all kinds of things that can creep in from here. Okay. And once they get in here, they'll, they'll wreak havoc. I got chipmunks. Foxes. I didn't pens. know chipmunks were carnivorous, but they're they, very they eat the chrysalis. They're opportunistic. They will what they eat are. these chrysalis all the time. Yeah, but officially they're they're granivorous, op uh, opportunistic. I don't like them anymore. I used no. to think they were cute at Christmas when they're singing their stupid song. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I saw one take off with the, one of these chrysalis, and I said, you sang it again. Yeah. And they eat baby birds. And oh, go, yeah. Wow. So that's baby. why I do these. These are, see the baby netting? Baby birds get eaten by, yeah. See how fine that it's is? It's really You're really not going to get anything through there. All the stuff you buy at the store. Right. And they're not that expensive. I sell these for like 15 bucks or something like that. But you can wash them with bleach and clean them out like you should right. to keep uh, all the pathogens away. And that's the, that's the tough thing about rearing cages is, you know, I used to have uh, hissing cockroaches, which are disgusting. Like, they're, they're not that the, not the insect is disgusting. Their behaviors are disgusting. Uh, they're just slums. So, you know, you, you always have this kind of sticky funk over everything. You've got to be able to wash them. But cleanliness is important when it comes to raising any right. type of invertebrates. Or, or well, especially something that, you know, already only 1% of the eggs even come close to making it. Exactly. And they don't really have an immune system. So when they catch a virus, they don't have anything to fight it off. Right. And unfortunately, high humidity like what we've had is what kills a lot of 
Yeah, I've got some syncopia moss out here too. Okay. Would you like to see them? Those would be that would be wonderful. All right, don't touch anything. I'll okay. be right back. Okay. Come on. I see they're on the hummingbird feeders. They know how to find the food. Yep. They learn quickly. So this is like you said. Once you get out in nature, you start looking around. And you see other things. And I found a wonderful little Cecropia moth on my lilac bushes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never really raised these before, so this is the first attempt at this. Oh my goodness, look at that. Wait till they get big. Don't wow. say they'll get the size of a Tootsie Roll. Oh yeah. yeah when they, they fall I mean, the out. Rock is huge. Oh yeah. And they'll, they'll, I mean, they're beautiful. And what wow. they're going to do. That is really cool. I've they, never seen one of the moth, or the, the, the larva before. No, and they change, they get even more colorful as they go along. So if I remember, I'll give you a cocoon. And you can keep it outdoors. That'd be wonderful. And then when it emerges, like in May, you get the lots of mail that go in five days. They don't have a bomb. The, uh, on Facebook yesterday, um, somebody had a, uh, a tobacco hornworm that had been parasitized by oh. a wasp. And then and, and all the wasp larvae were like drilling out of the yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. always a cool looking thing. It is a super <laughs> cool looking thing. As, as long as you're not the kid going for the larvae. It's goddamn terrifying. Oh, what it, it is. is. <laughs> it is. But that's another interesting point you bring up about the, uh, that type of thing. There's, there's the uh, Ophriocystis electroscura, okay. which is OE. When you read about monarchs, you will hear a lot about OE. And someone might say, well, you could be spreading OE by raising monarchs. Okay. So what we do is we will take, uh, like, one of these fellows here. So I can fix those wings, which I do later. So with, the, with a broken wing like this, I will splice it right here, that little flat, that, that hard, bony part along the ridge of the, I get a little tiny piece of wax cardboard and contacts it, and I will splice that way. So, could you also use the other wings? If I had to, but that one I wouldn't need to. That one was spliced, I, I do fix the wings for the yesterday. One, uh, the rest of the wing is good. Right. All it needs is a bridge right here. This part's hard. Yep. And hard there. Leading and there. when you get that little splice, and we're talking a tiny piece of wedge card, black card, and a pair of tweezers, and like a, just a tiny bit of contact in it, and some baby powder. And I'm going to put that on there, put some powder on it. And if something happens, it will just take a fly fine anyway. But if they lost more of the wing, like you know, hit by a car or something, then I'll replace the whole wing. But so like this, this belt right here. So I, I check them every once in a while by taking a little piece of scotch tape and they have a little abdomen in there. Right. I will put a little bit on there and take off some scales. Mm -hmm. And that's where you'll find most of the whole Okay. And then I have a nice microscope in the house. Can you check them out? So what is, what organism is that? Right, right back, it went back even. Like I picked you up at the dinner table. Yeah. From okay, your right steak. Back. And put you back, right back there. Uh, and that is a spore. So, okay, so it's a fungal. It's a spore. Thing. And inside that spore, it's got a hard coating, like a milkweed seed coating. Mm -hmm. And so it depends on this little caterpillar here eating that spore. So Mr. Monarch will come by, land on this leaf, and drop spores accidentally. Right. And that's how they continue. It, it depends on keeping the monarch alive so it can survive. 
So once it gets in the gut of that caterpillar, that spore dissolves into the thousands and thousands of more. So up here in western New York, up north, we don't have a lot of OE. Florida, 75% of their products are infected right? because the temperatures and stuff. So, but I check ours once in a while because if I had one that was breeding, we don't want to have her breed sure. more OE. That would be not responsible. That would be sending out disease monarchs into the wild. Okay, gotcha. so that's why we don't. That's why we check them. So if I get like I'll get a wild monarch, we don't uh, do a lot of inbreeding. So I don't raise caterpillars, put them in here, raise them, put them in here. Right. I'll get wild monarchs. That's how we start in the spring. I'll catch a wild monarch. And then that way we get the diversity and try to do things to play. We don't overwinter any. People say, well, don't, don't you? No, they say, why don't you keep them over the winter? You can start in the spring, but that's not how nature does it. So all of these were captured or, or in from, the spring. from the spring? In the spring. And then right now, in the next three weeks, you're going to see monarchs everywhere laying eggs for the uh, super generation. Okay. And there's a crossover point. Some of them will be super generation. Right. Some of them will be, uh, and they all don't migrate together. Some of them will wait till October. Uh, you'll see caterpillars out in October. They'll, you know, late. They're not going to make it. There'll be like one milkweed leaf and a big caterpillar. I can't save the world. You know, it's like, what am I going to do with right. this? Like, so I look the other way. Bigger bird, bird or something. Like that. Right. But uh, no. It's interesting. People say, well, how do you make any money? I go, I don't, I don't need a lot of money, but I'll tell you, you know, I feel like I won the lottery. The only thing that's missing is the money. You know, it's that feeling. Well, I mean, sitting in a flight tent with several hundred monarchs. I mean, this is... This is... <laughs> I mean, you're probably feeling kind of peaceful uh, right uh, now. This is, uh, this definitely doesn't suck, maybe. Yes, yes. But, uh, so, and it gives you a sense of doing something for the environment. You know, happiness is good, but contentment, I think, is better than happiness. Because when you're content, it's a, a long-lasting feeling. Happiness, if you and I go out for a beer after this, right. we're going to be happy. Oh, absolutely. But contentment is a long-lasting, it's not disposable. Happiness is fleeting. Yes, very fleeting. But it, there's a place for that also. So do we have any more questions you'd like to ask about monarch butterflies or what we do, nature, or are you just mesmerized? I'm mesmerized. <laughs> Taking that. So this morning, you're probably wondering how I feed all these. Usually I have, my main garden is over there where those posts are. Okay. So I'm replanting now. Uh, about two weeks ago, it was a sea of pink. Okay. All those plants have been distributed already, but I've got some nice pictures of giant swallow tails. There's a mating pair behind. Yep, yeah, I still want to get up. Trying to figure out what this guy is here. Yeah, snail. Snail, yeah, lots of snails. But um, yeah, that was our main guy. So I go out at night, like this morning. I went out at 3 a.m. Okay. And I go along the roadside and get nice fresh milkweed. Okay. This time of year, it starts getting a little yellow, like these leaves are yellow. It does, yeah. So, like I mentioned before, I looked for places where they've been mowed a couple of weeks ago. And they're coming and they're back. Coming and they're back, fresh. and they're fresh, and they're green. And I go out just because I don't like people to watch me and say, what are you doing, parking along the road? Sure. What's that guy doing? I, I pick up roadkill, Dave, I understand. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, that's what I do. This morning I came home, and then I fell asleep in my truck. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to the Grateful Dead, and all of a sudden the birds were coming up, yep. and I go, I'm just going to put this back. And what a long, strange and next trip thing it's I know, been. The phone's ringing. It's like 7:30. <laughs> my buddy goes, Hey, go for coffee. Where are you? I go, I don't know. I guess I'm in my truck. So, so it's an interesting life. But uh, tomorrow, all these friends will be going to the Ohio Street project. We're going to release all of these except for a couple mating pairs. Okay. And how many? And how many of these do you have cooking right now? Uh, right now, I probably got about a hundred. So 
when they're little like this, it's easy to take care of them. The eggs, stuff like that, I could put a hundred or something this big. Right. But as they grow, that's where it works. So every day, I go through these, give them fresh milkweed, look for the bigger and smaller ones and separate them. And uh, get the big ones all together and put them in a separate cage and then they make it this way. You don't want them munching on each other, but they usually won't do that until they're out of food. Right. So we uh, eat fresh food. I have a, a giant Gatorade cooler in the garage that I got, and I keep the milkweed in there when I don't think it's a lot of fresh stuff. But we still, we lose some now and then, you know, like I said, you get the parent, you know, the uh, stink bugs and stuff like that. Right. They will go right through this netting, or this netting. I'll come out and I'll see two stink bugs on there. And the caterpillar laying there like this, looks like an old sock hanging there. They put their snout right like, through yep. there and suck yep. the guts out of it. Wheel bugs, assassin oh. bugs, all those gut suckers. Yep. So, that's what we do. It's wonderful. And, uh, yeah, like I say, it does help them out. Even if we lose a few here and there, like caterpillars and stuff, at least we get a lot out there. Right. And the more, more important part is I have so many people thinking of like all these eggs, I'm not going to raise them all. I give them out free along with caterpillars at the market. Like this Saturday, people email me, you got caterpillars, and especially now with everybody home doing homeschooling. Sure, absolutely. The mothers, the families are coming up, but I don't give them out as a toy, I tell them. These aren't like painted ladies, you know. You got to know what you're doing. You can't just say, oh, give me five caterpillars, my kid wants to raise them. I want to make sure you know what milkweed is if, if you run out. So they're a great teaching tool. I could go on all day long and get the 12 pack and we'd be out here looking at little moss <laughs> That would be, those would be good yeah. rates. Fireflies here are, are extraordinary. Oh, with this high grass like this? When, I, when you come back, once your eyes adjust a little bit, you come back, it looks like Christmas. You've got the high ones in the trees yep. and the low ones. I left my window open the other day in my truck. I got in once it was like four in the morning to go get milkweed. Right. Roll the window up, start driving, and go like this, and they're lighting up on the, on the, the console on the top. They look like little LED lights. I took a couple of pictures of them. I go, that's going to be distracting. So if you notice on the milkweed plant, you'll have lots of things like this fella. This is a milkweed beetle. And if you notice, all the milkweed beetles are orange and black, once again, to, to let people... Be post coloration. Yep, to know that they're not going to taste so good, so nope. don't even bother eating me. Well, same thing with um, uh, the poison coral dart snake. frogs. Coral oh, snake, coral red snakes. next to black, yep. friend of Jack, red next to yellow will kill a fellow. But to tell you the truth, if I saw anything close, I wouldn't try and remember that, Ryan. No. I would just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. And that's what wildlife does. Like... So the Viceroy butterfly, they had thought was uh, uh, bait, uh, Batesium, Batesium mimicry. Baby, Batesium now mimicry. Now they're discovering it's Malarium mimicry because the Viceroy is also toxic. Right, so they both taste bad, so they, so they both taste, taste bad together. Bad. So now they just doubled their protection so that Dr. Malinium, uh, Malarian has uh, discovered that. They're all laying eggs now. They're going crazy with the egg laying, so we're going to have a lot of... Uh, eggs to get rid of. Yeah, so what we're trying to do is get away from plastics. Am I on yet? Yep. So what I do is I wrap these in uh, burlap. And this is how I like sell them. See how the roots come right through there? Right, absolutely. And uh, people like that. It's a lot more work. You know, I charge a little bit more because of the time and stuff like that. But uh, you can put this right in the ground, just cover it up to there, and uh, this sure. will all deteriorate. You can't put them in too early. Like I've noticed, they'll grow into each other if they're next to each other. Okay. But uh, I love burlap. It's a great tool for a 
burlap plant. Are you just using burlap from Hobby Lobby or? No, I, I or order whatever? burlap, okay. like a big roll of it. Okay. Yeah, if you went to Hobby Lobby, it's not. It's a different one. This is a nice tight weed. Okay. And, uh, so I use that. You know, it's it's a start. Right. It's hard to get away from plastics, well, but because, if you make, you know, if, these things. Oh, they're everywhere. You know, they're 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 everywhere, and they're. What do you do with? Them? Right? They're everywhere. You throw them. People throw people them. People throw them out. Yeah. I mean, you, I don't even think, most of them you can't even recycle. No. So, no, that's a, that's a great idea. Yep. Yeah. So that's how we like to at least make an attempt. Sure. You know, it's my my idea is that the, the more difficult something is to make a change, I think the better uh, is for the environment. You know, if it's too easy, everybody does it. I'm making video.